All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us for another edition of Webinar Wednesday. For those of you who have joined us for previous webinars, welcome back. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome. I'm Allison, and I'm the moderator for today's webinar. Today, I'm joined by three of my colleagues who together will discuss electron beam melting, offering high productivity and lower cost per part. Electron beam melting, also known as EBM, offers design freedom, excellent material properties, and stacking capabilities for efficient production of parts. The speakers today include Isaac Elstrom, Vice President of EBM Technology, Anders Ingvarsson, Product Manager for EBM Technology, and Klaus Raffid, Product Marketing Manager for EBM Technologies. The three will discuss things like what is EBM and why is EBM unique? Why is it so innovative in aerospace and orthopedics? What are some of the current customer applications and how is EBM helping those customers improve products and get them to market faster? And last, we'll look ahead at the research being conducted around EBM to explore what the future holds for this cutting edge technology. Before we get started, however, I just want to go over a few quick housekeeping items to make this a more enjoyable experience for you all. At the bottom of your screen, you'll find multiple engagement tools which you can use, and all of these tools are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. You also have the option to expand the slides or maximize them to full screen by clicking the arrows in the top right corner. I'll also ask that you please complete a short survey that will pop up for you at the end of the webinar to share with us how your experience was today and also let us know any other topics that you would like to hear about in the future. We have materials that are available for you in the resource list and I encourage you to download any resources that you may find useful. And last, if you have any questions during today's webinar, please feel free to submit them using the Q&A section, which is located on the right-hand side of your screen, and we'll try to answer as many as we can at the end of the webinar. So now that we've gone through how to make the most of your viewing experience, I will invite Klaus to get us started with today's webinar. Thank you very much, Alison. So uh, let's have a quick look at the agenda for today. Uh, we'll go through uh, the basic characteristics of EBM and what makes the technology unique. Uh, have a quick overview of the EBM market and after that going into four different application cases. Uh, and at the end, go through what is in the future of EBM. And, uh, at the end, we also are introducing this week a research mode that enables universities to develop their own MELT strategy. And more of that in the end of the presentation. So uh, let's start with the EBM characteristics. So Isaac, what, what makes EBM unique and, and how does it work? Yeah. So I'll try and give an uh, explanation of that. So um, EBM, as you know, is uh, additive manufacturing uh, technology. It's a powder bed uh, process. And what kind of makes uh, this unique or, or stand out from the other technologies on the market is that um, the energy source in this case is an electron beam. So it's a, a very uh, powerful electron beam. Uh, our most powerful uh, machine has a six kilowatt uh, electron beam. And basically uh, the electron beam uh, has some, some great uh, benefits and, and one of them being that it's very energy efficient. So uh, a large proportion of the energy that goes into the beam actually goes into melting material. Uh, which kind of gives way for a very high productivity with this technology. Another important thing is that since uh, we are using an electron beam, the electron beam can be controlled by uh, magnetic coils or magnetic lenses. And that means that you can position the beam 
uh, within microseconds uh, on over your entire build area. And that opens up for some very uh, novel opportunities on the material that you produce. And we will kind of dive into that towards the end of this presentation. Um, another thing that is kind of worth, worth uh, mentioning is that EDM is a vacuum process. So that means that the entire manufacturing process uh, with EBM is performed at, uh, at a very high vacuum level. Uh, and that means that you can produce very reactive materials without having, for example, uh, oxygen pickup during the melting or the solidification process. EBM is also very uh, well suited for materials which are sensitive to cracking, for example. So if you want to say brittle material. Um, and one of the reasons or the reason behind this is that we are carrying out our entire process at an elevated temperature. Um, and what that temperature is is very much dependent on which material you process. So in the copper case you would have a surrounding temperature of, of around 300 degrees. If you go to a titanium alloy, you might be in the 600 degrees. And if you go to very, um, very temperature uh, resistant materials, you might be above 1,000 degrees. And since we are doing all of this uh, within a vacuum, the energy losses are quite small. So I typically compare this to running a process uh, within an old uh, thermos because you are <clears throat> you are basically within a vacuum uh, you almost have no energy losses so the process as such uh, becomes very efficient and that is why we can keep it at a thousand degrees and at the same time being a very energy efficient process yeah thank you for that isaac um uh, so let's move over to an overview of the EBM market then. So Anders, please tell us what, what has been in focus for EBM for the last years. Yeah, and we normally talk about two markets. It's the orthopedic and the aerospace market. They're both big users of the Type 4 powder uh, or components. So when it comes to the orthopedics, when we introduced in 2004, TIE64, for EBM, we realized this is a really good match for orthopedic and the medical application. So we now had a machine that could produce TIE64 parts that was very suitable for medical applications. And with the freedom of design that additive meant that segment has just continued growing the last couple of years. The aerospace industry has consumed a lot of TIE 64 parts, so this was also natural for, for that industry to, to proceed in the same era, growing with more TIE 64 parts uh, that was quite bulky, that fits very well for EBM. And for aerospace, we also have, they are continuously improving or investigating new materials within that industry and seeing if it fits better for, for aerospace application. And some of those materials that they find is hard to produce in any other uh, method of, of uh, producing things. And EBM has unique capabilities here that could help that industry making, making those parts. Yeah, good. So we have today um, serial production than both in orthopedic and aerospace, that is. Correct. Yeah. And if we look then uh, in the near term, what, what do you see as the, the uh, new markets there for additive? Yeah, we are, as many of those, looking into opportunities that comes with electrification of cars and other vehicles, uh, copper being one of the main alloys here. So, so we're, that's one interest we see, uh, but there is also scratching the surface for other marketing like oil and gas where we find unique benefits of using EBM technology. 
Yeah. And looking at the, a little bit longer time perspective, what, what can we see there then? Uh, research has been very important for us for a long time since we, we've spun up with that, that segment. Uh, and there is so much more we, we anticipate that the EBM possibilities can do with material development and so on. So, so there is good, good chances to, to find new things within the research for EBM. And, and sometimes EBM is seen as a technology with very few materials. Why, why do you think that is the case? I think that was a business the strategy where we really focused on these two main markets and what they consume most of when it comes to specific material, in this case, Type 64, where we continuously develop with that, that product or that parameter set in the team. Yeah, so it's not any technical um, reasons no, for that. There's a lot more to explore within EB. Yeah, and, and more about that later in the presentation. Uh, so let's dig a little bit deeper into uh, the orthopedic uh, market then. And uh, as we mentioned, EBM is an established additive manufacturing technologies for all the implants that you see on this uh, picture. And uh, we can group the implants in two major groups. It's the custom implants that are unique for each uh, individual person and the more uh, serial production uh, implants. And um, EBM is used uh, in both of these groups and the benefit to use uh, EBM for the, the uh, customized implants is the low distortion that, you got, uh, uh, that the whole process provides. It makes it easier to get it correct at the first attempt. Uh, however, the strongest position for EBM is within the serial production of standardized implants due to the high productivity and the stacking possibilities. And we will now look into a case example with the hip cups. So, Isaac, you have been in the business for a while. Yeah. <laughs> so can you give us a little of historical background? Why, why was hip cup some, an application that early came up yeah. for this? So, um, so, like I think Anders mentioned earlier, uh, uh, we kind of quite early understood that uh, titanium 64 was a very uh, well suited material for for EBM, and, and uh, also like Anders said, that has been used uh, quite frequently uh, both in orthopedics and in aerospace. And um, basically, when it comes to acetabular cups. Uh, there are typically two uh, different types of acetubular cups on the market. So basically you are talking about um, uh, cemented hip cups or uh, the more advanced hip cups, uh, which is the one you can see on the image, which basically have a, uh, it's well, referred to as, as a trabecular structure, but you can say it's um, an area where you can have bony growth. So traditionally, uh, there are the tubular cups which had this kind of bone ingrowth or, or a, uh, a structure on top of it was really the, uh, the top uh, segment of the market. So it, it's a, a more, if you want to say, a, a much more expensive product compared to the simpler cemented uh, cups. And uh, at that time, and we are, uh, like we said, uh, talking early 2005, uh, the, the players on that market was mainly quite large uh, businesses because um, in order to, to create these really complicated structures, you needed several different process steps. So uh, a lot of investments have been done by, by a number of large players on uh, uh, metal vapor deposition methods in, in order to generate this kind of a metal mesh structure. Um, and that this mesh structure was then kind of attached to the acetabular cup through secondary processes. So it was a quite complicated process to, to generate this acetabular cup. Um, and 
basically when uh, when IBM add now or uh, entered into this market uh, since uh, one of the important things with uh, additive manufacturing is that you can basically design your component and you don't need to have tools and in this case you didn't need to have a secondary process in order to attach uh, a metal structure on on top of the cup basically you carry it you put this in the machine, and the machine then printed uh, the entire component, meaning that uh, you removed all the expensive secondary operations that you needed uh, on your cup in order to get this, this kind of coating on it. Um, and it also meant that companies uh, that might not be, you know, huge companies who could make this large investment uh, in this technology basically only needed to, to invest in, a, in an EDM machine in order to, to produce this. So uh, you can say we have a number of customers who, who took advantage of this and started entering the market uh, with this. And both uh, being able to offer this, if you want to say, high-end uh, product to, uh, to, to both a, a reduced price, but also removing some of the technical difficulties that you have on the cups. So one of the, the downside of the traditional way of making them was the adhesion uh, to, to the cup from the secondary coating. And now you have a, a component which is built as one single component. So you have, if you want to say, perfect, uh, perfect ad adhesion. So you, you, you receive a cheaper product with uh, overall uh, better performance. Um, and I, I think that is why this has, has grown. And, and today, I don't have numbers, but a quite large proportion of these kind of cups are produced uh, with additive, and a large proportion of that is, is then produced with EDM. Yeah, interesting. So just looking at the pictures here, up to the right, we have uh, the, how, how the hip cups are stacked in one build from, from a machine. So this is how many you can build at, at one and the same time. And we are ta taking one of these uh, stacks and uh, saw it um, to see how it looks inside. And here we can see how uh, the component is built in sintered powder. And, and uh, Anders, maybe you can explain a bit more why is it that EBM is a cost-efficient method for volume production of these hip cups then? Yeah, well, well the obvious that uh, Isaac already talked about, that we have the combined manufacturing method and we're also using uh, less waste of material. That's also an important thing for, for AM in general. Uh, when it comes to the EBM benefits, we have the stacking that you see on the picture that we actually can put uh, products on top of each other and build in the complete envelope of the EBM machine. So in one run, we can make a lot of hip cups, uh, not only on the build plate itself. Uh, and that gives a good pro productivity. Um, the simple powder gives us the opportunity to not having support on the parts all over. So, so we can, as, there is actually no support connecting to the part below it, uh, the other products. So there is some, you can see it in the, uh, the right picture that, that there is some heat sinks, but that is not connected to the part below it. Uh, so it's just removing heat. So it's no actual uh, support. And the, the benefit, most benefit here is, is also that there is no residual stress in the material since it's a hot process all the way through. Yeah, good. Uh, and uh, yeah, the, the, the sinker powder is then removed with a, uh, in, in, a, in a simple way in a, in a blasting or a PRS as we call it, a powder removal station. And uh, the the components each and all comes very easily uh, away from each other. So it, maybe you mentioned it, but if uh, we don't need support to build the overhang, why do we have some small supports here? Yeah, as I said, this is, 
we transfer away heat from when we start printing a, a specific part. We need to transfer away some of the heat. Um, otherwise, this becomes a bit of a strange starch uh, of the components. Um, but also, we need support. If, if we would like to do a free-floating uh, object in the some maybe in the middle of the build envelope, this is actually possible due to the center powder and with using support uh, of the part itself. Okay, good. Um, so let's move into uh, the aerospace, where uh, we have uh, this example of the uh, LPT blade, the low pressure turbine blade for the world's largest jet engine, the GE9X engine. And uh, those turbine blades are produced with EBM technology. Uh, so it's, it's the two uh, wings of, of uh, turbine blades at the very end of the, the engine in the hot part of the jet engine. And this is really one of the most challenging uh, environments, a rotating part in a hot part of the jet engine. So as it's in the hot uh, area, it's uh, sometimes uh, used with, uh, or built with nickel alloys uh, by using high L, titanium aluminide as the alloy. You reduce uh, the weight with 50% compared to nickel alloy. And this improves the fuel efficiency with the 10%. And so a lot of money to, to save there. In, in fuel consumption. Um, so this engine is uh, being uh, a part of the uh, new Boeing 777X uh, plane. And it has just the other week here been part 30 certified for the, for the um, aircraft. And that means that we now have ongoing serial production with, uh, with these parts. And it is actually a lower cost solution compared to costing at, uh, with these very large blades. Uh, they are very difficult uh, to cost and you get a very high scrap rate. And uh, today EBM is actually the only commercial uh, manufacture, additive manufacturing method for volume production of uh, titanium aluminide. And as uh, Isaac mentioned before, the uniqueness with the hot process really, um, you, you really see that in this example where this alloy is, has a tendency to crack. So it's, a, it's a good example of producing crack prone alloys with EDM. So uh, let's then move over to uh, some of the emerging additive industries uh, that we see. Uh, one of them is the electrification, and uh, that's a global mega trend, you can actually say, uh, not only in the, in the uh, uh, car industry, but also in a lot of other industries as well. And Isaac, can you can you explain a bit why? I mean, the, the alloy we see here and uh, produced in, in EBM is, is copper. Mm -hmm. And uh, Isaac, can you explain why is uh, that copper has a benefit to be produced within EBM? Yeah. So, uh, so one of the things we are looking for in copper when it comes to uh, to electrification is uh, conductivity. And basically, you can say that the conductivity of the copper is very much dependent on the oxygen content of the, of the copper. So uh, with the vacuum uh, environment where we uh, melt and form, uh, form the components, we're able to produce parts uh, with an extremely low uh, oxygen content. So that means basically that, that you get uh, less thermal uh, losses in your components, etc., which is extremely important for, uh, for that industry. 
Uh, if we are then also comparing EBM to other additive manufacturing technologies, one of the benefits that we kind of touched upon uh, in the beginning is that uh, the electron beam, uh, the reflectivity of the electron beam is not really dependent on the uh, material, it's, or it's, it's dependent on the mass of the material. But, but basically you can manufacture copper uh, very efficiently with an electron beam. If you compare it to a laser beam uh, where you would have a lot of reflection of the laser beam from the, the copper. Um, so uh, if you want to say extremely good fit uh, with the low oxygen and then the reflectivity, those are I would say two of the main drivers. And then of course on top of that you have the typical uh, additive uh, drivers with, uh, you know, free form uh, fabrication, uh, short lead times, etc. Yeah. Uh, and if we look into the other one, uh, the other interesting market here is the highly alloyed tool steel. Uh, the very hard tool steel has been difficult to manufacture additively uh, due to that material has a tendency to crack. Uh, this provides a unique opportunity for EBM. And Isaac, can you please explain this further? Mm -hmm. so, uh, so, I mean, this is kind of similar to, uh, to the case we discussed earlier with, uh, with the titanium aluminide. Um, uh, these, uh, these high alloy uh, steels are, are, are extremely crack prone. Uh, and by manufacturing them at uh, uh, a very high elevated temperature, uh, we can melt the material uh, with what's referred to as a small thermal uh, delta. So basically you can say across your component you will have a very small uh, thermal di uh, difference. And that means that you don't have any um, thermal induced uh, tension in the material. So basically we keep the material at, at an extremely high, uh, high temperature and are just raising the temperature a few hundred degrees in order to melt it. So basically we keep it close to, to the melting point. Um, and that gives us the opportunity to, to create also very, um, you can say, intricate uh, components uh, with, for example, internal cooling, uh, et cetera, which is, is quite difficult in, in these materials. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, have a little bit closer look at these two uh, applications or, or materials then. If we start uh, with copper, so uh, Anders, uh, what application examples has G-Additive so far explored? Yeah, we have a couple of them here on the screen right now. So there is a heat exchanger, uh, perfect for cooling various electronic components. Uh, we have the possibility with the free form that the additive brings, that the Isaac mentioned. Uh, that goes actually for, for all of these parts. Uh, we have two induction coils that with um, additive you can print this as one part. So say you can normally you have to bend or weld uh, these. Uh, but since they're printed, there is no uh, stress in the material uh, and of course no welding then. Um, we have also bus bars that could be printed in whatever way that is needed for that application that, that this area are ad adapted for. Uh, that's, we also have with this, this application we have the uh, oh sorry this uh, this process as I just mentioned that we have but we'll more or less uh, increase the purity of the material with our process. So, so the electrification is excellent for the, the deep parts. Interesting. Okay, and the, the other, the tool steel. Here, here we see a gear hob on the picture uh, produced in this very hard uh, tool steel. And what would be the benefit to produce this gear hob with EBM then? So they actually have two, two different gear hubs, and one minor and one larger one. Uh, this 
basically the larger one is the most interesting because here we also have the cooling channels that Isaac mentioned that we could add along the process more or less where we can have uh, internal cooling channels for, for when you're using the, the, um, the hub. Uh, and we have the poss possibility with our process to process this crack chrome material that no one else technique or no AM other technique can, can do at this point. So, so we have a really hard material that we have been able to, to produce with our technology. Interesting. Uh, so, okay, so, so these were then uh, walkthrough of uh, today's markets. Uh, we have the uh, orthopedic and aerospace. We had uh, the two new materials, copper and uh, tool steel. And so these are the things that we today see that EBM uh, can do. These are the materials, the titanium, the uh, traditional 718, and uh, uh, cobalt chrome. Uh, but we also have the, the copper and the tool steel uh, coming up from below the surface, so to say, and being uh, shown to the market. Uh, and the known uh, opportunities we have today with the, uh, with the EBM technology is about the high productivity that we talked about, the stacking capabilities, the, the uh, we don't have um, the stress relief, uh, or we don't have uh, uh, need any in in stress relief heat treatment uh, of, because of the hot process. And uh, we have then the possibility to uh, produce these uh, reflective materials, as, as Isaac also mentioned. Um, so. This is then what we see about the surface. But let's go further away in, in the future then. So I, I here turn to Isaac, and uh, there are so much more to explore uh, below the surface, yeah. so to say. What, what, what uh, can you please walk us through this? Yep. Yeah. So, uh, so I think this is something that we have, uh, you know, uh, I would not, maybe not say discussed, but uh, we, uh, the EDM, uh, we see that a lot of the value uh, of EDM is is uh, below the surface, or uh, I'm not sure if it's an English saying or not, but the beauty is on the inside. And so, um, where we see uh, a lot of, of future value uh, with EDM is is on the, if you want to say, the material properties or, or what you will be able to do with both with different kind of materials, but also how you can tailor uh, the inside of the component uh, to your needs. Um, our view is that today um, there is a lot of focus on the outside of the component and uh, if you look from a mechanical design perspective, you are typically defining the outside of the component, or the, you know, the, the shape of the component. But what we see uh, as the next step, and where we believe EBM uh, will be a, a huge player, that is basically on how do you design the inside of your part, and not uh, and not in an if you want to say homogeneous state, as you might be today, uh, where you manufacture a component uh, with, for example, a certain, uh, a certain microstructure. Um, maybe you want to have different microstructure in different regions, etc. So if we kind of move on. Yeah, uh, but let's first ask the audience what, what uh, you, we have some uh, future materials below the surface. So, mm -hmm. so let's ask the audience, what do they uh, believe in the, the uh, future? What of the following materials would you like to see as the next commercial available EBM material? 
And uh, here, please go in and click. You can select one or several of uh, the materials here. Yeah, thanks, Klaus. Okay, everybody, so while we're on the topic of materials, once again, we, we want to ask you guys, um, what materials would you like to see for the next commercially available EBM material? And as Klaus noted, you can select more than one. So if you would like to choose multiple answers, please do so. Um, the selections we have are high-temperature nickel alloy other than 718, stainless steel, titanium alloy other than Ti-64, a refractory material, for example, a tungsten or niobium, high-strength aluminum alloy, or a cemented carbide metal matrix composite, or MMC. We'll give just a few more seconds for everyone to select. And then we'll go ahead and look at the live results. So let's see. It looks like the highest vote was uh, cemented carbide, metal matrix composite. Uh, followed just by high-strength aluminum alloy. Um, Klaus, Isaac, um, what do you guys think about the the results here on the poll? Okay. Uh, right, yeah. So uh, from what I can see, we have high-strength uh, aluminum alloys and cemented carbides uh, as, you can say, uh, brief, uh, brief uh, winners. Um, but a quite quite wide interest. Um, I think, to be honest, that uh, the cemented carbides is is uh, a, a quite interested or interesting uh, uh, range of materials. Um, I do know that there are some activities at, at a number of universities, both uh, both in uh, Europe and in the U.S., uh, looking into uh, metal, metal matrix uh, composites. Um, and uh, yeah. And, and why would EBM be a good uh, technology for for uh, those materials? Yeah. So uh, this is materials which is, is very difficult. Both, I mean, they are they are. Um, um, uh, they can be brittles. I mean, they are. You can say uh, uh, they are an even tougher version of the the, the high alloy uh, uh, steels. Okay. Um, so it's uh, yeah. It's again the hot process. Yeah, that exactly. Is. It's it's the, the hot process and the, um, yeah. I think here the potential to do even more complex uh, geometries that you uh, that you might be able to to do uh, with EDM compared to, to normal or, or conventional manufacturing. Okay. And I think also high-strength high aluminum is, is kind of interesting. And it's also one of those areas where we have, uh, at one point, we said, okay, aluminum might not make sense because it, it's fairly cheap to, to manufacture with uh, conventional manufacturing. But uh, I think we have over the years realized that there might be a market for for especially high strength uh, aluminum. So, yeah. Okay. Good. Interesting. Thank you all for for um, your answers. And uh, let's have a little bit more look uh, below the surface, Isaac. We we have two parts here uh, or two sections that we would uh, go into a bit more. The tailored me mechanical properties. Yeah. Explain. What is, what, what is that for you? Yeah. So, so this is what I, I also started to uh, explain uh, earlier that, uh, I mean, what we see uh, moving forward is that uh, in the same way as we, uh, with our particular cut, removed uh, a number of process steps uh, when we put uh, the coating directly into the, the manufacturing method of the cut. Uh, the same way you can, uh, by basically controlling your your microstructure uh, as you build, you can give different parts of a component uh, different um, characteristics. So uh, what we see on the screen uh, to your right is uh, um, MR247. 
uh, small blade. And basically what we have done is that uh, you have some, some different demands, some different parts of the, the blade. So um, in, the, uh, in the lower part of the blade, uh, you want to have a, a structure which is, um, uh, you know, um, uh, fatigue, uh, fatigue and, uh, no, sorry, uh, creep resistant. So uh, there it, it makes sense uh, to have a, a, a duplex uh, structure. But when you start to go into the, um, into the, um, the foil, the foil of the blade, uh, directionally solidified material uh, makes more, more sense. And today you can't really manufacture, you know, one part with one microstructure and another part with a different microstructure. But uh, by using EBM as a kind of a manufacturing method, you can localize uh, your microstructure. Um, and we think this is something that in the future will open up for a, a completely new way how you how, how you design components. And it's also, like we said, it's quite easy because you are getting the microstructure directly in the original manufacturing process. So there are no kind of secondary steps. Um, and I mean, in this case, you wouldn't be able to do it with the secondary steps, but of course, uh, for some other alloys, you might be able to, to do some hardening, et cetera, to kind of get localized properties. But in this case, you, you do get localized properties um, uh, already in the initial manufacturing process. Okay, so let's go further deeper down in the, uh, <laughs> the iceberg, uh, iceberg then. Exactly. So, uh, so one of the things that uh, I think everyone understands is that when we kind of look at, uh, at materials and, and uh, a lot of industries, so especially I think uh, aerospace industry, but also to some extent uh, the orthopedic industry, there is a lot of, um, you can say, validated alloys uh, that you use, and those alloys have been around, I mean, some of them have been around for a thousand of years, and, and some other of them might have been around for 50, 60, uh, 60 years. And those alloys were kind of originally developed in, in order to give you the optimal property set for a certain manufacturing method. Um, and uh, that uh, method might be a, a, a casting or a casting, as we see on the um, on the screen here. However, when it comes to uh, EDM or, or also other additive manufactured uh, materials, we see that uh, by changing the alloy composition, uh, you would be able to achieve uh, superior uh, properties just by playing around with that. So. I think the combination of this kind of microstructure control in order to give you uh, different properties and then at the same time enhancing uh, those properties by going in and starting to make EBM specific alloys is some of the things that we will see uh, throughout the coming years and decades. Um, okay, thank you Isaac for that deep dive. <laughs> uh, and finally then in the presentation, we uh, this week we have launched something we called the research mode. Uh, and Anders, please give us some more information about this. What, what is that? Yeah, this is uh, one way of maybe going for these years or decades that Isaac is uh, talking about. How can we get help for this uh, because eBeam has been, we're quite small on the market, there is not many producer, but we have a nice research and academia uh, community supporting us. So what can we do to, to get help from our friends, let's say? And, and that's why we have then looked on what is something we can do 
those that segment of users. So uh, within the machine today, you have production mode and engineering mode. It's just different steps of handling the machine. Uh, and then we have development mode, where we have opened up more parameters to make it possible to make material development. And now we have then research mode. So research mode allows you to make your own melt strategy. So you then uh, just showing, yeah, you say where you would like to have the beam and, and go through uh, each layer. So, but this is a, a new functionality within the machine. It's an EBM control, uh, and that will be on the latest version of, of uh, the machine control system, 6.0. And, and with that, we also have a couple of tools that is necessary to be able to, uh, to control yourself or what, uh, what you actually are researching for. So here, here you have what the new research mode actually is. You have a coding part where you do your um, or program your mouse strategy. You can visualize your scanning strategy, uh, and then you also see it. Uh, the last picture was uh, how it looks on the machine. There are some circles and, and squares. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, that concludes the presentation, and with that, we will go over to the question and answer session. <coughs> Hey, thank you so much to Isaac and Anders and Klaus um, for sharing such great information uh, with everyone about EBM. Um, Klaus mentioned we'd like to spend a little bit of time now answering some of the questions, and we've received a ton of great questions today, so thank you, everyone, for your participation. Um, the first question that I'll ask, and we had, we had this asked in, in various forms, um, so multiple questions on this, but um, can you guys share with us what the largest build size available for EBM is to give us a little bit of detail about build size, build chamber? Yeah, uh, the largest build size is on the Spectra L machine. It's uh, 350 millimeter in diameter and 430 millimeter in height. Thank you. And then do you have any other um, details on other build sizes of the other EBM machines? that you can share with the audience? I mean, there are uh, <laughs> several of them. And, uh, <clears throat> so the Q20 is today 350 times, uh, so in diameter, times 380, I think. Um, and if we then look at the Q10, that is uh, uh, 200 times 200 times 200 uh, build volume. And then you have the A2X, which is the 200, 200, 380. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, the next. Oh, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, that's good. Okay, so the next question um, is what are some of the most significant advantages for using EBM over laser powder bed fusion? Mm hmm. So uh, I think what we mentioned uh, before uh, with um, productivity is an important one. Also the, the low uh, distortion, since we are running at the, the elevated temperature, uh, you can, you can um, manufacture components uh, uh, where you would get uh, distortion on the, on the laser base. I, I think it's it's very much uh, you know part to part uh, decision, similar to you know which part would you do uh, with the capping or what would you do from a machining etc. Um, so there's definitely yeah there there is a technology for each for each component so to speak. Great, thank you. Um, a couple of questions on this, so I'll ask uh, just one. Um, what is the effect of the electron beam on the microstructure of the part? Mm -hmm. This is probably so, a good question uh, for Isaac. Yeah. 
So, um, as such, uh, I wouldn't say that um, uh, the energy source itself um, really uh, affects the microstructure, but what you can say is that um, uh, one of the benefits that I see with, with EBM is that we can, to some extent, control uh, the solidification rate uh, depending on how, how we, we choose to melt. And we can also um, control uh, the solidification direction, uh, and and those those are key in order to have this kind of tailored microstructure. So by controlling the solidification direction and the solidification rates. Great, thank you. And I think another question for Isaac, um, somewhat similar, um, in the presentation. You stated that there was no heat treatment needed for electron beam melting. However, it's understanding that with EBM materials, it is required to HIP or some similar type of stress release process for the final product. Um, can you elaborate sure. on the HIP requirement? Sure. So uh, basically, you can say that. Uh, so first of all, I would say that uh, whether or not you need to heat treat the part is, I mean, one, dependent on which type of uh, material you are running. So certain materials will require uh, a heat treatment. Uh, so if you, if you run the INCO 718, for example, you, you would need to do a, a heat treatment. Um, and, and that would be from a microstructure uh, perspective. Um, if we instead look at heat, so heat, uh, typically, you don't use uh, in order to change your microstructure. It's rather uh, in order to to remove any uh, small uh, porosity or something that that you have in your material. So uh, we have some inherited por uh, porosity from the powder manufacturing uh, process uh, within the material. So if you have extremely high fatigue uh, demands on your components. Uh, we would typically recommend you to hit because that would uh, increase the, uh, the fatigue life. So once again, yeah. it's, it's very much up to the application uh, whether a hit would be necessary or not and what kind of property set you're looking for. Okay, thank you. Um, just to transition now to a question on the actual materials that are used, can you share with us what are some of the main differences in the materials that are used for electron beam versus laser powder bed fusion? Um, and how is this, um, the question is how has this been dealt with in terms of powder material technology? So I guess just talk about the differences between um, the powders used with the two technologies. So uh, I think in, I mean, yeah, it's a quite broad, broad question, of course, but I think if you look at fundamental uh, powder properties, the, the, the demands are fairly similar for both technologies. I mean, you would like to have a powder with as high packing density as possible and as high flowability as possible. Um, then there are variations if, if we strictly look at you know, powder morphology or powder. So uh, laser typically works uh, with uh, finer powders and EDM with slightly coarser powder. Uh, you can, of course, do, I mean, you could, you could run um, laser powder, I guess, on an, on an EDM machine uh, to some extent. But the, I would say the overall, um, the overall requirements are, are, are fairly similar, but we are slight, on slightly different size scales. I'm not sure if that was the question, but. Yep, I think that's good, thank you. Um, so same topic on materials, the question about copper. I know we talked about copper a couple of times in the presentation. Um, when is copper going to be offered as a commercial material and for which machines will it be available on? Uh, so we actually started to print um, benchmarks and we could offer a copper um, collaboration more, uh, so uh, if there is any interest, please take contact with us. Um, and uh, at this point, we are printing on a Q10 uh, and investigating uh, to do it on Spectra L uh, in the coming year. 
Thank you. Uh, another question. Thanks again, guys. We have so many great questions coming in. Um, can Can you guys discuss the powder removal process? Um, is the powder difficult to remove after the build is completed? Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, you can say that the, the powder. Uh, yeah, I I I tend to uh, compare it to uh, kind of wet sand that you have on the that you have on the beach. So uh, the the powder does stick together in a cake. Uh, you can say, and um, we typically remove it by uh, using uh, like a compressed air, um, also with some powder in it, so like a um, blasting cabinet. Um, uh, you can also remove, uh, you know, with vibrations, etc. if you have powder in, uh, in like in internal channels. Um, but I wouldn't say that it's, um, yeah, you know, it's, all the powder that you are uh, removing can then be reused in the process. So it's kind of a recycling process where you basically uh, remove the outer shell, you can say, which basically becomes a powder, a powder cake. So yeah, wet sand, I think, would be my best um, analogy. Great, thank you. I think we have time for probably one more question here. Um, and we had a couple of questions come in that um, pertain to the research mode, which I know you guys discussed at the end of the presentation. Um, could you give a little bit more details about uh, the research mode and if you're planning on offering this for older EBM machines, for example, um, and if somebody wanted to get more information about um, accessing research mode, what they can do? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so basically, what what research mode is, and, and um, uh, today you can say that the electron beam is being controlled uh, by, um, you know, uh, basically code uh, developed by by G additive. Uh, so we tell the beam exactly where it's supposed to be, etc. Uh, what the electron or sorry, what the research mode does is that it gives the user the opportunity to basically tell the electron beam where it's supposed to be at any given point. So you can say it's, it's like moving from a self-driving car to a, a manual car. <laughs> uh, uh, and so so you can, you can basically pick, and, and now this becomes maybe a bit specific, but we have, we call them the different process steps. So we have uh, initial heating step. You can choose either you do our predefined heating step or you come up with your own heating step. Uh, and that you can, I mean, you, you, you get total control of the beam, so you can do basically, you can move it exactly how you want. The next step is the melting step, you know, where we melt the component. Today, we have defined, you melt uh, what we call the contour, and then you make the interior of the component. If you want to, you can take control also of that. Uh, and then you completely decide how you want to melt your part, if you want to melt it in, I don't know, sinus waves or uh, whatever. So basically, you can, you can you, either you can do everything on your own, or you can pick a specific process step and do yourself, or parts of a process step. Um, Adding great. to that is soft, but we will start giving this away to A2X users or uh, selling. selling. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> but it, it will be able, available for A2X customers, also existing ones, and it's not only for new machines. So it's, if you have an A2X with a Windows 7 computer at least, we would that is the target. And we should have this available to Christmas, around Christmas this year. Great. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, it looks like uh, we're coming to the end of our time together here at the top of the hour. And I would like to say thanks again to everyone for joining us and listening in. And a special thank you again to Isaac and Anders and Klaus for joining us um, to discuss all things EBM today. Um, today's webinar will be available on demand if you would like to listen to it again or perhaps you'd like to pass it along to a friend or a colleague. 
and I encourage you to register for our upcoming webinars as well. Before you log off, I just ask that you complete a short survey. It will pop up for you in a minute. Just share with us how your experience was today and let us know about any other topics that you would like to hear about in the future. And I look forward to seeing you guys next time on our Webinar Wednesday series.